Open your Bibles up to the book of Habakkuk. If you don't know where that's at, look for it. You got an index. Um, you can open up your Bible about halfway and then page to the, to the right about another half and you'll, you'll be there. It's one of the minor prophets that are called. The book of Habakkuk. Lord, it's hard to follow up. Um, it excites me to see Hannah step out that you've placed an itch in her life and uh, she's scratching it and she's, she's trusting you. And then to hear her mama's, her mama's prayer for her, uh, the, the holding on and letting go simultaneously, Lord, we bless that. We just thank you that your kingdom is worth all of our effort. Some go, some stay, but you, Lord, gain the glory. It is your power and your strength that works. Lord, you've placed us here. This is, this, is the, this is our assignment as this church in northern Wisconsin in this area. And I thank you for it. And uh, it, is not without, it is not without its challenges. But at the same time, Lord, your power is able to break even the barriers of the unbelief here. As Hannah is going to a country that has had the name of Jesus for a long time, but has not known your power, Lord Jesus, I pray the same for our nation as well, for this area. Your name has been known among the people here for a long time. Lord, we're just asking you to break, um, break the hearts down that, of unbelief, and that you would gain for your glory trophies of grace in our, in our neighborhood that those who are now blind can see, those who cannot hear will be able to hear and recognize your love for them. So, Lord, teach us to love one another all the more. Let us not hold you at arm's length, but embrace you as I hope I can show the people through this book, that we can embrace you as you've embraced us with your love. Holy Spirit, Master, Teacher, come this day and your word up pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to dig right in. Habakkuk is a small book. Um, and for this series, I'm going to be using the ESV. I just, uh, in, the, in, in past years, I, we've take, I've taken you through some of the scripture books. You can just take a book and we, we try to go through them systematically, just having you read portions. And uh, so that's what I'm doing this time. This is where this is my this is my study booklet. You know, it's just a little book of Habakkuk and a couple of the other minor prophets, and write my notes in here as I sit in my office or I sit in a coffee shop and study or wherever I can. So we begin this little book with just this simple opening statement: the oracle that Habakkuk, Habakkuk for some of you doesn't matter, the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. Now, this name, Habakkuk, is only used two times, and it's both in this book. Verse 1 here in chapter 1, and then chapter 3, verse 1. It's the only time that we actually, uh, that that name is used in the whole scriptures. Uh, as, of course, people tried to figure out, well, what does it mean? Is, does Habakkuk's name mean something? And some commentators say it's just a, a flower in a Syrian language, so... Maybe he was maybe he was a cute little kid, and his mom gave him a name that made him look like a flower or something. I don't know. I, however, believe it's a play on words uh, from another Hebrew word, chabach, and it's 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 a word that means to embrace. And so it's it's a repetition of this word chabach, to embrace. And I think this fits very well with Habakkuk's uh, oracle, you could say. To embrace is to clasp one's arms, to hold on and cherish and love. So that's what um, that's what you see. One of my some of my grandkids with their stuffed toys or their blankets. At that that is they embrace those. That's that's a love object, and so they hold on to it and they clasp it. And of course, when loved ones show up at the airport, the tendency is to do what when you first see them, is to embrace them, hold them, bring them in. Habach. 
or embrace could be to take up or adopt like a soldier's life. You, I embrace the soldier's life. I embrace the marine life in my, my past. I embrace you know, this lifestyle. Or it's to comprehend or take in, to embrace it, to hold in, you know, just to hold it and say, yep, that's, that's something I want to keep. So Habakkuk may have been his real name or maybe it was just his pen name. Maybe it was a nickname. Uh, regardless, the idea of embracing, I think, fits this book really, really well. Embrace your God. I, that's the title that's I'd put over this whole series that I'm going to go through over these next four to five weeks. Embrace your God. The book of Habakkuk. So what's he saying here? He says the oracle, the communication of God. Uh, it's also a word that means to be a weight or a burden. In Numbers chapter 11, we get into Moses' life a little bit. Now, Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, so they're on the, they've escaped Egypt. They've gone through the Red Sea. God's parted the waters. He's supplied many times different ways, and yet they still are like Americans. Every time the gas goes up, we get grumpy. They complain. So Moses is in a portion here where they're doing it again. Now Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, each man in his doorway of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly, and Moses was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, this is fun, why have you been so hard on your servant? Why? Why? Why have you been so hard on me? Why have I not found favor in your sight? that you have laid the burden of all this people on me. That's the idea of the burden. So Habakkuk is, is spilling out a burden, a weight that he seems to have, and he, he's, he knows the sourcing of it, and he goes to God and says, hey, why this weight? Why this burden? Well, so there's a weight and there's, I would call it, freight to the words of Habakkuk because of God's way. Habakkuk is having to deal with God's way of doing things. And I think we do too. I think sometimes we bear the weight of how God does things. So here's the book of Habakkuk. Here's this little book to help us. And then it says what he saw. What did Habakkuk see? What was revealed to him? Was it a visual? We don't know. Was it a, a vision or a dream? Again, we don't have enough information. Was it a text message, maybe? Maybe he was one of the first cell phone users. All we know is that what he saw was something that God revealed to him. And Hebrews 1.1 also brings up this whole thing. God, after he spoke long ago through the fathers in the prophets, so I can say he has spoken to us through this little book of Habakkuk, in many portions, in many ways. Then, of course, the writer of Hebrews goes on and says, God really spoke to us in Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus is the main spokesman for God the Father. But here, the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. So what did he see? Did he get the answers? Yes, but he doesn't, God doesn't give a press release that's complete. Reporters hate when politicians hold back. Just tell us everything. And I think we wrestle too sometimes when God doesn't tell us everything. There's something about that. And so Habakkuk, but God says exactly what needs to be said when he needs to say it. So the first thing that Habakkuk sees is himself. Let's read verses 2 and 3. I'll just read the whole. I'm only going to go through the first three verses this morning anyway. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. Habakkuk is just honest. The first thing he sees in this is he sees himself. He sees himself and he says, I don't like what I see. And what I see is hard. 
It's a burden. It's, it's, I don't want this. We don't want this. Why is this happening? And why aren't you doing something about it? So the oracle and the burden of Habakkuk in these three chapters that we have are broken down into three components. I think I have them listed here. The complaints of Habakkuk is what we just looked at. And then we're going to get his second complaint. He didn't complain enough. <laughs> so he's going to complain again. But in between there and before and after, in between, we have God's responses. So we're going to see the Lord's responses next week. And we're going to look at another one of his responses in the second complaint. And then the last chapter is a, a prayer psalm. The last chapter is Habakkuk and us, I hope, um, dealing with the ways of God and embracing them and embracing him and trusting him when things don't seem right. So Habakkuk is a dialogue. It's, it's, it's much like the book of Job. Um, there's dialogue in the book of Jonah as well between Jonah the prophet and God. And so there's... And brothers and sisters, I believe it's really important that we, you and I learn in our, that a lot of times when we pray, we're dialoguing with God. There's a back and forth. And of course... Uh, most of the time, he speaks to us in such a way that we, when you open the Bible, you open his mouth. So we are opening God's mouth in the book of Habakkuk over these next few weeks. But then there's a dialogue that goes on. There's a back and forth. And sometimes our prayers shouldn't just be, you know, nice little rote prayers. I think there's a place for rote prayers, actually. I think just like when we, we pray for certain people in a certain way, I think that's good. But I also sometimes think it's really important that you learn to dialogue with God. And I hope we can see that this morning a little bit. This is a dialogue, one we get to listen in, in on, and then we get to respond, and then like Habakkuk, I think we can practice some of this dialogue technique. This is not just information. So when you people come up here north from somewhere down south, and they stop off at the visitor center out there. A lot of them go and come out with a bunch of brochures, information about our area and what they can do while they're up here. What happens to most of those brochures? You've done it yourself, haven't you? They're probably, how many of you got a stack of these things in your glove compartment of your car? Yep, I got a hand. Yay! They're just right there, and they sit in there. Well, this information that God gives us is not to be like brochure information that we just kind of peruse once in a while and throw it in the glove compartment of our car. This is something that is supposed to ignite and look into the soul of ourselves and see. This is not just information. This is revelation, and revelation requires response. Job had to do this, Job chapter 40. And the Lord said to Job, Will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? Let him who reproves God answer it. <laughs> let, him, let him answer. And then he goes on, I think. Do we have it? No, maybe it. Nope, that's it. So Job has finally got God's open, opened his mouth in such a way that Job hears him that way. And Job realizes right away who he's talking to. And so then he goes... I better shut up. I better listen. So when God reveals, our major response is to listen. But we don't just stop there. We listen and we respond. So life events can open our mouth. Life events can open our mouths to God. Do the life events around you open your mouth to God? That's what Habakkuk is doing here in these first few verses. The events of what's happening in his world open his mouth up and he addresses God. And it's a complaint. 
It's, it's, it's a complaint. This is a complaint. This is a lament, if you want to use a more technical term, but this is a complaint. How many of you complained this week? All right. So you're used to complaining. So find out why you complain. Well, it's, it's always somebody else's fault when you complain, right? Or do some of you have the dialogue in the mirror in the morning? Man, I am going to have an, an idiotic day, and I will fill it with idiocy today. <laughs> Complaining. It's biblical. <laughs> Don't laugh. This is biblical. God, I think, has given us the ability to complain and lament that we may dialogue with him. So here's Habakkuk. He's complaining. He's his first complaint, and we read it already. And it's the use of parallelism. So if you look in verse 2, you see this. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear, or cry to you violence and you will not save? This is a classic example of, of Hebrew parallelism. It's, it's making a statement and then following the statement up with the, basically almost the same kind of statement or, in this, in this instance, a question. And that's, that's to emphasize it. It's to restate it, shade it with a difference of an emphasis. But basically, I think verse 2 is, do something. God, do something. Why aren't you doing anything? Things are bad. Things are really bad. But then he goes on, he says in verse 3, and why do you make me see iniquity? Why do, you, why do you idly look at wrong? Why? So he's filling himself in here. He's, he's, he's entering into this. It's the cry of one who wants to be faithful to God, and all he sees around him is unfaithfulness to God, or so it seems to him. I want, I want what you want, God, and it ain't happening. What's the deal? Why me? <laughs> Why me? How many of you used that one this week? Why me? Again, it's biblical. It's in the Bible. I think sometimes we're not even awake sometimes to who, you know, what's really going on inside us. And sometimes the why me really does need to come out. I grew up in the Midwest where you learn to shut down your emotions. I learned to shut down the, some of the things in my life. And I think the Bible and the Lord himself helps us to open up. I think sometimes the biggest deal we deal with is just being honest with ourselves and honest with God. I think sometimes we're afraid of being honest. And I think God is the God who can handle it. Well, there is a reason things are going on. Just like there's things, you know, there's reason things are going on now, too. There's explanations for it. That's what all these people write about. That's what historians write. Well, this happened because of this, and this happened because of that. And, and then they, we got, we got to understand this thing. That's what they do. Well, there's some background here for what's going on in Habakkuk's time and what's, why, he is, why he is saying what he's saying. It's the time of Habakkuk is most likely set... Um, probably maybe a couple decades before the Judean, the southern kingdom of Israel. So if you remember your history a little bit here, Moses brings the people out. They take the land. They're supposed to cleanse the land. They didn't do a really good job of it. And then there's the book of Judges where they had leadership that kind of went and came and went, and their hearts would go back, and they go back and forth, back and forth. And then they said, we want a king. We want a king. And so God gives them a king, gives them King Saul, I think in some ways to show them that a king is not a great thing, but then he gives them a King David. And David unites the tribes. He unites all the 12 tribes. And then after that, David's son, Solomon, comes into power. And Israel goes to its, its peak. It's, it's the wonder of the world. And in some ways, it's exactly what God's intention was for Israel, to draw the nations to him through their testimony. But money got the best of them. 
and their kingdom divided, and they got mad at each other, and they split up. Ten northern tribes, two southern tribes. So the ten northern tribes are, by this time, about Habakkuk. They're on their way out the door. And then Judea is still, Judah is still hanging on, but it's, things are pretty, pretty bad. World powers are growing around them. At that time, China was Babylon. Assyria was Russia, if you want to just try to give the idea of putting in your mind world powers. Well, Habakkuk is set most likely during this moral deterioration of the kingdoms, but especially the moral deterioration of the kingdom of Judah. The Babylonians and the, and the Chaldeans, they were called Chaldeans, as we'll see next week in, in chapter 1. That was their name, the magician, the, the wise ones or whatever. But in 2 Chronicles chapter 33, I'll just read some background here for us in this, what, what he was facing. And this really comes out of uh, the actions of coming. Hezekiah was a really, really good king. Did a lot of reform in the kingdom of Judah. Brought the people back to God again. Cleansed and brought down the high places. But one of the things that didn't, didn't seem to work well for Hezekiah is that he didn't know what to do with a 12-year-old. It says this in 2 Chronicles 33. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king. He reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had dispossessed before the sons of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah, his father, had broken down. So Manasseh is Hezekiah's son. He also erected altars for the Baals and made the Asherim and worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. The Asherim was a, a female deity, a goddess of fertility. So if you can imagine very depicting of sexual organs and things like that, and he puts it in the temple area. He built altars in the house of the Lord, for which the Lord had said, My name shall be in Jerusalem forever. He built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. He made his sons pass through the fire in the valley of Ben-Hinnom. So that means he killed some of them in the fire. He practiced witchcraft, used divination, practiced sorcery, dealt with mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. Then he put the carved image of the idol which he had made in the house of God, of whom God had said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen for all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. I will not again remove the foot of Israel from the land, which I have pointed for your fathers. If only they will observe to do all that I have commanded them according to all the law, the statutes and ordinance given through the Moses. Then, or says, thus Manasseh misled Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the sons of Israel. It's a little sidelight, but I think Hannah is going to be in a country that it fits in some ways this way. They have forsaken God and have him in name only, which is vanity. But here in this time, Manasseh was dealing with um, a nation that a king had removed them. Um, there are some things that when they progress, there's no going back. And we find this out in other places in Scripture that Manasseh took Judah so far into the darkness that God says there's, you're, you're going to have to pay for this. There comes a point when there's a line crossed and, and God says enough is enough. Will that be in our nation as well? I think so. There comes lines that a nation crosses and they can't come back again. Now, God is gracious. God is merciful, loving kindness, full of faithfulness. But it's in the midst of this darkness that many times he saves people. But he doesn't save whole nations. He judges them. So Habakkuk is now encountering a group that has the name of God, knows the name of God, but does not honor God as God. Isaiah said it probably, Isaiah was probably a little bit before Habakkuk's time. I think, I think Isaiah was either past, had been killed by now or was 
towards the end of his ministry. But here's one of the things that Isaiah said in his prophecy. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet, sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Welcome to the United States. Now, not completely. Please, please understand. You know, I'm just putting in the context here. If I was, if I was speaking in Angola, I'd, I'd probably be able to say the same thing. Certainly, if I was in any of the Western nations of, of Europe, I could say the same thing. Calling evil good and good evil. Have you seen the progress in this? Have you been watching it? Do you feel the weight and burden of it? Then Habakkuk is for us. Habakkuk is for us. This is a time when, great, when there was great hypocrisy. Using the Lord's name in vain. This was, this, they had used God's name in vain for decades. And yet in the midst of those were the faithful who felt this darkness. And that's what Habakkuk is doing. He's crying out to God. Those like Habakkuk were in the ministry of the faithful. Um, you know, we just... There are faithful people today in the midst of some places that are even darker than, than where we live. They're God's people. And they feel this. The idea that we're just supposed to be smiley and everything's fine and everything's great, you know, I, I, be careful because there is a place in the scriptures to teach us how to complain correctly. Now, that's the difference. Complain correctly. The deterioration of spiritual morals was the weight on the faithful. Habakkuk expressed it in complaint and lament. And David sang the blues too. So let's look at one of the most famous blues songs in the scriptures. This is Psalm 13, verses 1 and 2. David sang the blues. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Does it sound familiar to Habakkuk a little bit? Have you ever said that? I wouldn't, I'm, I'm being real careful here. I wouldn't be too guilt, feeling guilty about that because I think sometimes we need to learn how to sing the blues correctly. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take up counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? This is complaint, this is lament. This is David Porton. Now, we don't know. Sometimes people like to historically put all the Psalms into the right historical context. Sometimes we can do it. Sometimes we can't. But David knew trials and tribulations, and he knew how to sing the blues. How long, Lord? How long? But look what he does. He goes on then. So he's got something else he can say. Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him, and my adversaries will rejoice when I am shaken. So he sees in this, there's a tension here, because in verse, the, the third verse up there, he's, who's he reaching out to? Does he know that God can answer him? What's he scared of in verse 4? That his enemies will laugh at him and deride him. And worst case scenario, be right. Sometimes I think we get, we, we get in unbelief and we get scared that, that people might be right and God is not God, that he is not who he says he is. But there's something about singing the blues that in the scriptural way is always important. That's the last two verses of this small psalm. Psalm 13, 5 and 6. But I have trusted in your loving kindness. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. So he begins with what? Begins with complaint, then he explains the situation, and then he says, this is going to be my response. I will do this. I, I will trust in your loving kindness. I will rejoice in your salvation even when the burden is still on me. 
I know in the last few months, having dealt with illnesses and stuff like that, what's, what's the one thing you want when you got an illness? Go away! I want to feel good again. And sometimes I think we sing the blues because that's why. We want it just to go away. And we don't let God do his work in the midst of the pressure. And in the midst of the pressure, the desire is to come back and worship him. And I think we're going to see this in the book of Habakkuk. Because we know historically Judah went into exile. Judah was judged for their sin. And it was not a pleasant time. And many righteous people suffered in the midst of that. Some of the righteous were killed in this time. But God, be praised, his ways are better than ours. So what David does, what Habakkuk does, is he basically, uh, he doesn't avoid it. He lets the grief out, and then he talks about the fears that he has, but then he circles back to God again. And I think sometimes, again, we got to be honest with our fears. <clears throat> got to be honest with, our, with, with, our, with the woes that we might be facing. There's one person that can handle anything you give him. That's God. I can't, so please don't talk to me anymore. <laughs> no, just get the idea. Do you ever get, do you ever have people come to you with stuff and, go, and you go, I, I absolutely have no idea what to do. Well, that's it's okay. That's time to sing the blues a little bit. But then what we constantly try to do is direct people back to, to God himself where we're going with them. So Habakkuk begins or ends this complaint, what we saw as a complaint in chapter 1, verse 3b, destruction and violence are before me, strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth for the wicked surround the righteous so justice is, goes forth perverted. So he's basically saying what is right is, you know, people are saying what is right is wrong, what is wrong is right, evil is good, good is evil. He, he recognizes it and it's, it's a weight on him. But He's dealing with what most, I find most people deal with in life. If, I, if I'm honest in looking at people, what they want, they want justice. Now, they may have a different standard of measuring what justice is. A three-year-old who has a toy taken away from him has an appeal for justice. I want, that's mine! But we do that too. That's my life. My life. It's mine. The God of the Bible says, no, it's not. It's mine. It's on loan. I'm, I'm not a Limbaugh guy, but I kind of, you know, like it, uh, on loan from God. That's what we are. That's what we have. But he is, his, his ownership is a beautiful ownership. But the devil's lied to us about his ownership. And sometimes we believe the lies more than we believe the truth. So there's a place for, and it's, we'll see this, I really honestly believe this. So if I had a thing today, if, you know, the message title I have is filing a complaint. <laughs> I think it's okay to file a complaint. Just be careful how you do it. So lamentations, if anybody should complain, <laughs> Jeremiah knew how to complain. He knew how to bear a weight. But in the book of, uh, of Lamentations, his, probably one of his last things that he wrote in the middle of chapter 3, we read this. Who is there who speaks and it comes to pass unless the Lord has commanded it? Is it, now look at this, is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both good and ill go forth? How many of you wanted to snap your fingers to deal with Ukraine? Or anything of that matter? Look at that, look at, oh, go back. <coughs> who is there who speaks and it comes to pass unless the Lord has commanded it? Huh. 
hold these things when you read the news. And probably going to have to wrestle just like Habakkuk. Why aren't you doing something about it? The law is paralyzed. Here's the law that God has given, and it doesn't seem to have any effect at all. It's numb to the situation. That's what Habakkuk says in his complaint. But Jeremiah in his complaint goes on to say this. Why should any living mortal or any man offer complaint in view of his sins? Now, wait a minute. Here I am telling you as pastor, go ahead and complain. Trying to balance the complaints out a little bit. Let us examine and probe our ways. Let us return to the Lord. Let us lift up our hearts and hands towards God in heaven. This is after the fall of Jerusalem and everything that Jeremiah wanted. I think Jeremiah died with a frown on his face. And yet I think his reward is great. But this is what we got to do. So why should any living mortal or any man offer complaint of view of his sin? So we, we, we catch that. We, we get that. Um, many times somebody else will remind us of that too. You know, Angie and I go back, who's the pot and who's the kettle? But we're God, we're, God made us to be alive. <laughs> he made us to be alive, to experience, to feel, to know, to seek. That's what we are. So we want to make sure that that is a direction that we have then. So there's a place, I really honestly believe, there's a place for the blues. There's a place for us to, you know, to offer, if we want to use it, complaint. Um, I think from Lamentations, we learn that we, we should be careful. We should look at our complaint, where it's coming from. Um, but the one thing that what we're trying to do is, in the complaining is, is that we are trying to look at life as it should be, and it isn't. And I think many of us know that. It should be like this, and it is not. What do we do with that? So what was, what's Habakkuk's solution? That's one of the things that we're going to answer as we go through this letter. And I really believe it comes back in some ways to the title that I've given to this series is that in Habakkuk's name is, the, is, is, is in some ways the key to the whole thing in the first place. That's that Habakkuk in the end embraces God. Knowing that he doesn't, he, he, God does not have to answer every one of his questions to his satisfaction. That God has a purpose in what he does, even when it doesn't seem like it. And he embraces that. So we have to ask, what was Habakkuk's solution to the problem? Well, we're going to see that. But I'm going to, I'm going to speak as I close here with words from our Lord himself. Because in some ways, what Habakkuk was doing, in, 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 and this is important, remember that a lament and a complaint biblically is praying. When we lament and when we, when we complain to God, we're praying. That's what we're doing. We're bringing it out. He's not standing off to the side. You ever, you ever gossiped about God with somebody? You know, like, hey, he's over there. He can't hear anything we're doing. Not a chance. So you might as well be honest with him. And so here's Jesus' words to his disciples. He was telling a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart see i think i think habakkuk and some of the prophets there were points in their life when they lost heart because it just it just weighed so heavy but the grace of god in their life and god's loving kindness in their life wouldn't let them stop they kept on hoping just like david said i will trust you in your loving kindness, even in the midst of all these sorrows that I'm in. I will trust you. Don't quit. Don't ought to pray, not lose heart. Saying in a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God, did not respect man. You know any of those people out in our world? I do. There are people who don't, don't fear God and don't respect man. 
We're, we got a whole nation, it seems, full of these kinds of people. Well, he says, there was a widow in the city. She kept coming to him and saying, give me legal protection from my opponents. For a, while he was, for a while he was unwilling, but afterward he said to himself, I like this, said to himself, even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet this widow bothers me. I will give her her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. You got any people in your life that will wear you out? This man says, man, I'm just going to give her what she wants. I want her to go away. Is that biblical? The Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge said. Is he affirming the judge's way? Not really, and yet he is. Now will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night, and will he delay long over them? What's the expected response from his disciples? No. He, in his time, he will, he will not delay. He, he will bring it about. There will be justice. There will be God justice. But look at what Jesus says next. I tell you that he, God, will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So I think we have a lesson to learn from this little book of Habakkuk about holding on and embracing God in the midst of whatever comes, no matter how dark it seems, no matter how hopeless it might seem at times. You know, there are many people, you know, my age and older who, you know, I guess if you look back, sometimes you don't always remember the junk. You tend to, you tend to remember the good stuff better. That's kind of a freaky thing that we do. And America's going down the drain. If we could just get back to where we were, we'd be okay. No. We need, we of all people look ahead. We do not look behind. The only thing we look behind to is what has been done for us on the cross. From that cross, being on the cross with Christ, accepting him as Savior, that he took our place before a holy God and a righteous judge and judged our sins on the cross, we can look ahead. In the midst of the looking ahead, though, there's some room for complaining. But let the complaint be a dialogue between you and God the Father, who loves to hear from his kids. And let the Holy Spirit work on your soul to trust him no matter what. So I hope in this little book of back next week we get to hear God's response to the complaint. Because God does respond. I believe God responds. When we pray, he responds. It may not be the time that we want, may not be the way we want, but if our hearts are softened, he will respond, and he does respond. So Lord, I guess, I, again, I pray for us as a, a little church here in northern Wisconsin that we could be your church here in northern Wisconsin, your people, doing kingdom things, beautiful things. And Lord, I know that we bear some of the weight of, of, of our nation and what we see, the literally millions of children who have been killed for many times just to convenience as a form of birth control. Lord, for the, the, the changing of moral principles where Evil is good and good is evil. Lord, we see it. It weighs on us. Lord, I pray that you will teach us to complain correctly and that you will hear our cries and you will deliver us. And in that deliverance, Lord, may we recognize that your strength is always there no matter what. So I thank you, Lord Jesus, for Grace Bible Fellowship. I pray for us to grow in our honesty with each other and with you. I pray for us, Lord, to be a witness for you in our community, that we have a, a message to share with our neighbors, we have a message to share with anybody, that you are who you say you are, Lord Jesus Christ. 
Bless us, Lord, because you are the one who blesses. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.